Good morning and welcome to the Raymond Sims Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network streaming live at Spreaker.com. It is another week, it is another Monday and we hope that you're having a good one. Rather you're out on the West Coast and you're just getting your day started or you're on the East Coast and you're already at work and you're already just waiting for that meeting to you know be over so you can go to lunch however you are going about your day i'm glad that you're spending part of it with me coming to you from the coliseum sports network studios here in chicago Uh, got a busy show here i am going to be talking a lot of football today both college and pro and i'm also going to get in of course the world series which they had two uh, games happening over the weekend a huge momentum shift uh, in the course of the World Series, going from the scrappy underdog, the Royals. Things have turned around here for the San Francisco Giants, and now on this travel day, they head into tomorrow, one win away from taking their third World Series in the last five years. So some exciting stuff happening there in the world of baseball, and of course, it's it's a Monday, so we got to get into you know pretty much all the football uh, that happened yesterday. And last week I did all of the football, like literally all the Sunday games. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a lot of the games, but for the most part, I'm really just going to uh, to focus on like some of the games that I actually have something to say about, basically. But uh, just in case you don't know, I'm Raymond Sims. Uh, this is the Raymond Sims Show. You can check me out uh, on Twitter, at Sims Coliseum, where you can chat with me. Now, I also have a, a chat function here on Spreaker.com, so you can log in at Spreaker.com. Look for Sims Coliseum. You'll see the show streaming and you'll be able to chat along with me and I can get your opinions on stuff and things and that'll be great. Also be sure to follow me on Facebook for all the latest happenings and whatever funny news stories I come across and then on Tumblr if you're into pictures and cool things like that. First game I got to talk about of course is my home team the Chicago Bears. They are not looking good and the nation is taking notice of this. They were shellacked, basically, by the New England Patriots to the tune of 51 to 23. And it, was, it wasn't it was even that close, quite honestly. Uh, they happened to uh, kind of come back there late in the game. So it ended up being uh, 45 to 7, two minutes into the second half. So the 51-23 score wasn't even that close. Was a, they were able to score 16 in the second half. And it's really something when you get routed like a college football team in the pros. That's when you need to evaluate pretty much your defense if you're the one giving up the 51 points. And there's been a lot of talk here, a lot of disdain for defensive coordinator Mel Tucker. There's a lot of people that do not wish for him to be employed for an, an extended amount of time. And it's going to be a wonder to see what changes will be made at all. The Bears are heading to, into a bye week at three wins and five losses. So we'll, we'll see what changes are made. But a lot of people are thinking, or a lot of people in this town at least, are thinking that there won't be any changes made. Fair amount of these players are under contract for a while. So we're stuck with the likes of Jay Cutler, I believe Brandon Marshall, is also under contract for a while. The coaches, like Mark Tressman, is under contract for a while. So this could go either way. Either the McCaskies could eat an absurd amount of money, which is pie in the sky thinking in the salary cap era here of the NFL, or they're going to stand pat and try to hang on to their plan and just see if it works itself out. We've seen teams like this in the recent past, some that I've heard uh, from other talk show hosts recently, the San Diego Chargers and the Dallas Cowboys, two examples of offensive minded teams that have uh, they they when you thought about them, you were like, man, this team has a great roster because you were really focused on the offense. I mean, what fan isn't these days? A lot of people love offense, but when you pull back the curtain, you realize that it's really only three to five good guys. Your quarterback, your running back, 
and a receiver or two. And in the case of the Chicago Bears, it's Jay Cutler, the quarterback, Matt Forte, the running back, Brandon Marshall and Alshon Jeffrey, the receivers, and Martellus Bennett, the tight end. Outside of that, it is a whole bunch of other question marks blocking and playing defense, especially on defense. And that's really the crux here. Again, it's not good when you give up 51 points in a professional game. Now, I mean, we see our blowouts. There's 31 to 7. There's 28 to 3. Those happen. And those are the blowouts you expect. But not 51. And oddly enough, there were two 51-point games in the NFL yesterday. And we'll talk about the other one just a little later. So you think about the offense as, as the team and you think they have a great roster. But then you, you realize that there's a whole lot of other problems going on. And a lot of us here in Chicago are realizing that very quickly. We realized it kind of going back. Uh, we, we sensed trouble once they lost to Buffalo. But we, uh, we sort of ignored it. They, they lost to Carolina. We, we got worried, but we had a little optimism. I think the Miami game, where the locker room imploded, the fan base imploded as well. There's a lot going on here in Chicago and not a lot of optimism that anything is going to change very soon. Now, with all that being said, another gem coached by Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. And yes, I, I, I kind of consider Tom Brady a coach there, not intentionally, but when you think about it, he is also a huge part of the game plan as he has been for years. And it's justified because you get results like what you saw here uh, against the Bears. The Patriots really just came home and there wasn't a lot of optimism from Bears fans about how this would go, but you didn't think it was going to go down like this. Tom Brady, 30 for 35, only missed five passes, just five. 354 yards, five touchdowns. Anybody that has him on his fantasy team is probably doing the shmoney dance right now. And then in the backfield, they get Jarvis uh, Jarvis Gray, Jonas Gray. <laughs> See, that's just to prove my point there. Got his name wrong. Jonas Gray out of out of Notre Dame, but pretty much if you're not from if you're not a Notre Dame fan, you probably hadn't heard of him. He's definitely a deep cut there on the album. Uh, he pulls through in the backfield, and it's like, who? 17 carries, 86 yards. Didn't get a touchdown. Didn't need a touchdown. Tom Brady had all those taken care of. And it's really been something that we've noticed for years as kind of a plug-and-play sort of thing with the New England Patriots, that whoever you get in there, they're going to perform, and they're going to perform well. There have been moments with the Patriots where they have been worse at times than other times, but for the most part, uh, you know, what, if if you're on the team, you're probably going to p- perform very well under Bill Belichick's system with Tom Brady under center on offense. Uh, you know, the defense has had to shore up at times, and they did give up 23 points. I guess that's a consolation late in the game because uh, it, it's not it's it's a decent defense. It does what it has to do, but they're not locking down anybody. As a matter of fact, Jarrett Mayo who's supposed to be one of their main guys, he was out. And, and yet the team was still able to, to hold things down against a, a quarterback in Jay Cutler that while he's, he's not, he hasn't been good lately, it, it hasn't, he, he's done well enough. And there's a lot of finger pointing, as I alluded to earlier in this segment, about who is to blame for all of this. And quite honestly, you can, you can point to a lot of people i think the reg- the 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 usual suspects in this case are the defense the special teams and the coaching staff because as i said before when you think the bears and think about the good that they have you realize that the offense they're the guys that are pretty much the only prime performers but then you you also point at the coaching staff on the offensive end Because a lot of people were saying that this team should run the ball more and that Forte should probably get a few more carries than he's been getting. And I think his carries have picked up as of late, so that's helped a little bit. 
but apparently not much. So moving forward, there's a lot of questions here in Chicago. Uh, in New England, they had questions after that Monday night shellacking against the Chiefs. But they were able to turn things around. But that's the difference between New England and Chicago. New England has Tom Brady. And you can wonder if Tom Brady's fallen off. But he hasn't been doing a lot of that lately. He's, it's not happening now. That You don't have that kind of same confidence in, in Jay Cutler. The thing that bothers me about Jay Cutler as of late, and I alluded to it last week, was his his nonchalant tone. Tone means a lot, and I'm sure I'm sure you hear that uh, all the time, quite a bit. You don't want to say that he's not a leader because he's a quarterback. He's a professional quarterback. He's very good at what he does. He did very well at Vanderbilt. He's done well for himself in the NFL. So he's he's made his hay leading peop, leading players into positions to do well. But when you are in a rough situation, when your team is losing a lot of games, you need a little more fire out of your leader. And unfortunately, uh, Jay Cutler's voice does not exude the fire that would soothe the savage beast that is the Bears fan base. And rather not that's intentional, maybe that's just how his voice sounds, or rather he really is nonchalant and thinks, hey, no, we can get over this, it's no problem, I'll shrug it off. Uh, that's not that's not what needs to be heard right now. He needs to be a little more, he needs to be, not a little more, he needs to be a lot more forceful than what he has been giving us over the past several years. When the team was winning, and uh, the Bears would get into a, a rough stretch. That That's one thing. You can write that off. You can say, oh, you know what? He's a calm leader. He, he doesn't get frazzled in, in situations. But when the going gets tough like right now, you need him to be a little more forceful. You need him to be a little more boastful or, or boisterous rather, as opposed to having the wide receiver do the job for you. Going to talk more football in just a moment, but let's take a quick break here. It's the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Coliseum Sports Network. Streaming live at Spreaker.com. It is the Raymond Sims Show. Just got done 
talking football, talking Bears and Pats. I guess what I'm going to talk now. More football. It's it's a football Monday. Probably how it's going to be until, uh, well, I guess until January. It's just going to keep rolling with the football every Monday. Just talking about uh, some of the things that stuck out to me. Uh, one of the things that probably stuck out to you, looking at the NFL schedule and seeing a game at 8.30 in the morning in, in, in central time zone here, 9.30 over east uh, I think it's 10 o'clock in Newfoundland because they're, they're a half hour ahead for some reason Falcons and the Lions playing in London I didn't realize that this game was going to be in the afternoon London time I, when they said they had three London games and this is the second one of the three that were, are scheduled I figured that it was going to be like pretty much all of the others that have come before it. One o'clock Eastern start. That is eight o'clock Eastern in London. So a primetime game out there and an afternoon game here. We're just getting up, uh, getting ready for church, coming out of church, depending on your time zone. But no, this one's in the was in the morning. We woke uh, woke up to Wembley. I think was that what Fox was that the term that they used? We woke up to Wembley. Uh, I w I woke up in time because I, I had to go go to church myself. I woke up in time at halftime. There was part of me that was thinking about waking up early enough to just watch the game because there's something about morning football. The college football did this. Earlier this year, Penn State and Central Florida, when they were over in Ireland, they started in the morning as well. Some about morning football. That's just really uh, interesting. It's a spectacle. I'm, I'm thinking of other morning football examples that are popping in my head. I think San Jose State did one in the mid to early 2000s. Uh, mid 2000s, it was on ESPN. San Jose State, I don't remember who they hosted. I could probably look that up uh, in the next break because it's probably going to bug me all day if I don't um, and I also think of a it was a commercial it was a beer commercial where this happened where it, it was like some network asked the or asked like one guy what he thought about football coverage and apparently he wanted football coverage on it Tuesday morning so like the next scene it, they had they show it was like he was looking at a TV and it showed the promos like coming up on Tuesday morning football and the announcer like yawned while he was saying it. It's a beer commercial from a while back. It's funny what my mind remembers and what it doesn't. But morning football is 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 very interesting thing. So I figured why not wake up for that. But I like sleep, so I didn't. I I just decided hey I'll I'll wake up when I wake up. Because the, the NFL windows were uh, set up intentionally so that the, that uh, morning game followed by the normal 1 o'clock games, followed by the normal 4 o'clock games, followed by uh, the Sunday night game. They, they set it up that way. So anytime I wake up before uh, 12 o'clock noon, uh, well, I should be awake by then because the service starts at 11. But as long as I wake up by then... I shouldn't have to. I should catch the game, and, and why not? So, I I didn't worry so much about the time. Like I wanted to watch this historic moment, but at the same time, I wanted to value my sleep and and stamina. So I got I caught a little bit of it while I was getting ready to head out. Uh, once I started watching it, you know, it felt like a regular uh, football game, and it's interesting because. We can have a debate for days just talking about, oh, I think they should have games overseas and they know it'll mess up the, the body clock and the the football in the morning. It, it just isn't right. And really, once you sit down and watch it, it's a game of football. It might come out a little sloppier if the guys are tired, but they're they're preparing throughout the week. So they might be a, a little a little better equipped than, say, if basketball or hockey or when they do it, when they go overseas, or, or baseball, for instance, where that's literally played every day. 
But, you know, sometimes football is just football, man. And once I was watching Fal- the little bit of Falcons and Lions that I watched, uh, that's what it was at the end of the day. It was football. And it, w- it was nice. I saw a couple of, of plays at that juncture in the game. Again, coming just out of halftime, the, the Falcons were ahead 21 to nothing. And I was, I was like, man, uh, the Falcons laying it down overseas in a different time zone. But I think that was around the time that the Lions had started turning things around. I know there was at one point uh, Matt Ryan just threw an awful pass. Yep, and it was inter- that was the interception to it was the pick six. I think was that was that a thing that happened? No, it was just a it was just an interception. I believe to Cassius Vaughn. Is that a name? Yes. I'm checking here on the fly. Well, okay. It was the only interception of the game. So that helps. Or the only interception for the Lions. So that helps me figure out who that was. Yes, Cassius Vaughn, 45-yard interception. That was the one I caught. That was just a bad play on, on Ryan there because where he – I don't know where he thought he was throwing it. I think he was just trying to throw it away. But that's not a good idea to do, and I'm sure Matt understands that. But the only player – that was even close to that football was Cassius Vaughn. You would have thought the play was written up for him. Julio Jones was a couple yards over toward closer to the sidelines. And he may have seen, I'm thinking maybe he may have seen Julio and his arm saw Cassius and and they just, they did not communicate well there between uh, eyes and arm. But that was pretty much the beginning of a huge turnaround in, in the second half. Eventually, uh, Matt Prater will score a field goal that made it 21 to three. Then Golden Tate got a huge strike from Matthew Stafford for 59 yards that made it 21 to 10. And the Lions chipping away, and then they just made they went full comeback in the fourth quarter. So it was all Falcons in the first half. It was all Lions in the second half, and the Lions eventually co- come on and win off of Matt Prater 48 yard field goal at the buzzer and win 22 to 21. So that is that's a rough loss, and this is a team I watched and rejoiced as they mollywopped the Buccaneers on Thursday Night Football just a few weeks ago. And you saw what the granted it was against the Buccaneers, but you saw what the Falcons could do when that offense is humming, when it, it when it's going, and you know I guess that's what inconsistent teams do. They show flashes of brilliance. And then they don't bring it together all the time. I'm watching that right now in my backyard. So this is another rough loss for the Falcons. And yet, oddly enough, at two and six, they are not completely out of contention in the NFC South. That that's crazy. A two and six Atlanta Falcons team is not completely out of their division race. They are behind uh, Carolina, 3-4-1 and one because of that uh, tie with, with, uh, with Cincinnati. And New Orleans finally showed up and, and laid, laid down the smackdown on Green Bay at home under the lights again. I think that what they said that was 13 primetime wins straight. Or, or were they talking about home games? I'm, I'm not. I uh, can't particularly recall. But New Orleans, they 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 got it together against Green Bay. You can't, uh, you know, you can't call if they're really turning it around yet or not. But they're three and four. So Atlanta, for all of their flaws, they're still in it. I mean, honestly, the Buccaneers only have one win, and they're still essentially in it. I mean, it's going to take a lot for the tables to turn here and they're starting they're starting to become a divide in the NFC South but statistically Tampa Bay is still in it with only one win so a lot is up in the air but if if Cam Newton and the Panthers and uh Drew Brees in New Orleans if they get any inkling of sense together if the team starts connecting again then then they're going to start pulling away here in the NFC South. So if, especially Atlanta, I mean, Tampa, I'm kind of joking around with about how close they are, but as far as Atlanta is concerned, 
they still have an outside chance. And if they want to, if they want to turn this around, then it, it, moving forward, they, they're going to have a very slim shot. Matter of fact, let's take a look at their schedule. Now they're going into a bye week, coming off of five straight losses, counting that uh, comeback loss against Detroit that happened in London. So they have a bye after that, but then after that, they play at Tampa, they play at Carolina, and they play against Cleveland. And that right there, they'll put them at five and six. The next game that they play would be November 30th against Arizona. So that's not a that's not a guaranteed win at all, as we've seen how the Cardinals have been. But there's a chance to turn around, at least coming out of the bye week. You're fresh, you're ready to go, and you're taking on so-so teams. Like Carolina... You, you would hope that maybe they don't have it all together yet or that Atlanta is in better shape. And then Cleveland, we see that even they're above 500 in a, a tough uh, AFC North. So it's like, hey, Cleveland, we're, we're Cleveland. We're above 500. Yeah, get in line. But Atlanta could still have the firepower to take down Cleveland as well on paper. That's why they play the games and may and once these games are played and if Atlanta does not come out on the better end uh, of these three of those that three game stretch off the bye week, then maybe we'll see what they're really made of this season. Maybe it's just it's just not meant to be and it's not coming together for Mike Smith and his boys. Uh, I'm thinking about it right here on the fly here that maybe this is just another example of a team. You think, oh, this team has a good roster, you know, and and. I think of good roster and I'm really thinking Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, Roddy White. Maybe they don't have a good roster. Maybe they have glaring problems on on defense and have some issues on offense and on the offensive line. And at two and six, maybe there's a chance that there's no maybes about it. My last thing, the point that I want to make here before I go to break is talking about London. Uh, you know, I alluded to it as far as morning football and the debate that that it that that brings up. And I'm not on the side that we should have more morning football. I appreciate the event aspect of it, and also, you know, more, morning is going to throw everything off completely for for these football players who have it rough enough already. But I'm really not a fan of the xenophobia towards having a team in London. Maybe the Super Bowl is a bit much. It's American football's biggest event, and you're going to ship it overseas out of reach from a lot of people who have to pay for Super Bowl tickets and pay to go over to London. So that's too much. But I think maybe we should ease up a little bit on the idea of London having a team. I I think that if you grow enough popularity of American football in the UK and that uh, something as much of a cash cow as the NFL could be able to make football over there work. But let's get a team in Los Angeles first. Take a quick break here. This is the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network and Spreaker.com.
Raymond Sims Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network. I meant to clarify this at the beginning of the show that it's not it's not a same song Monday, but uh, in the midst of transition here with the music I'll be using for the show on the first show last Monday, you may have heard uh, some songs that you're familiar with. Uh, there was the instrumental to uh, the return of the Crooklyn Dodgers. I love that instrumental. One of my favorites of all time. The instrumental to Odd Soul by Mute Math. And there was, you know, a couple of other songs that I kind of pulled off of my iTunes. Uh, I I needed to uh, make a change in terms of the music I use since it is not my own. And, you know, I I'm, I'm not I'm not about the, all the thievery. Um, uh, you know, what. Well, I want to make sure what's mine is mine. So, especially once this get once this gets uh, archived over to the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube, Sims Col- uh, YouTube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sports Net. Yeah, they are very stringent on YouTube, as, as some of you that are also maybe video creators might know about third party content. So, I don't want to get in trouble for that. You know. Again, I want to make sure what's mine is mine or what I'm using is is a fair use. So you're going to be hearing this same song, at least for this show. Uh, it's called Catch the Sun by Ronnie. I don't remember which site I got it from, but it is freely available, free to use. Uh, and I'm going to be looking for other royalty free music so that we can all have a good fun time without any lawyers knocking down the doors of the Coliseum Sports Network headquarters here in Chicago. Hope you're having a good morning wherever you may be in whatever part of the country that you're in. If you're on the East Coast and you're already at work and you're just looking at the clock, it's already 1130 and you, you, you're you just waiting for lunch or you're taking your lunch now. Uh, I hope I provide a good lunch break for you. Or if you're out West and you're getting into getting into work there, it's 830. Yeah, you're almost late, but uh, I know traffic can be a mess in, in certain cities out West there. So I hope you get there on time, man. Don't want the don't want the boss all in your face. Just got done talking about football. I had to clean up a point there towards the end about a about football in London. I don't think it's so bad. Don't maybe not put the Super Bowl over there because it, because it's American football's biggest event. But in terms of a team, I think that football is pretty much the only sport where it would work logistically because uh, of the week layover between games. Uh, it, it's it works a lot better than say in in basketball where it's pl- games were played every other day or hockey where it's the same schedule or baseball where it's played every day. Even though I'm sure baseball isn't really worrying about extending into Europe just yet. But yeah, just finishing up some more football talk here in the, in the back hour, in the back end of this hour. Uh, Bears and Patriots, Lions and Falcons. I, I touched on a little bit, but mostly as a vehicle to talk about football in the morning in London. But now let's get into some more car wrecks, uh, Bills and Jets. Let's talk about that. Uh, the only reason I want to talk about it is because Geno Smith was really, really bad. Like he was doing the type of things that I would expect to do if I was to put Madden on Hall of Fame mode. Like if I bought, if I went to buy Madden, which I don't have, I'm not buying it this year. Uh, go to the store, I buy Madden, which I haven't played. Uh, I play, I have Madden 12, but that's for uh, Sims Coliseum related reasons that you'll find out down the line. Take it out the box, play it, just go, go into the menu, go to Hall of Fame mode, and then play a five minute game with the Jets. That's that's how I would look on the field, the way that Geno Smith was in the first quarter. He only played one quarter. He threw eight passes, and three of them were to the opposite team. Five yards total, uh, 0.6 yards on average. He had a QB rating of zero. Just not a good look there for Geno Smith. And it's a shame, too, because I I believe in Geno. I had no scouting on Geno. I saw, you know, like everybody else, I saw him at at West Virginia. And you know how how the West Virginia offenses go. But 
I saw how he carried himself at the NFL draft when he was not picked in the first round. And he was moping about it. A lot of people got on his case about that. And that's when I decided, hey, I'm going to take up for this guy. And I thought that he would succeed. I thought with development, you know, he'd get better with time. But this, this is not this is not good. Two of eight and eight of those pa- two passes completed. Three were went to the other team. Now, it, it's already bad if you're two for eight and you got two p- complete passes and and six incomplete but to have a to make it a cell pie chart and have the largest chunk I'm doing the math on the fly here to have the, to have the largest chunk going to the opposite side that that's just awful Michael Vick came in 18 for 36 uh, one interception no touchdowns those were credited to the rushing Chris Ivory and Bilal Powell a Bilal pal. Yes. No, I'm not going to get it right. Well, that was right, but it sounds weird with my accent. But it it's a problem there in New York. And it's it's worse than here, uh, at least for now. The the Jets have have just have never looked good. And the the GM that they brought in, people thought that that would make a difference. He seen you they wanted Jets fans wanted a a fresh face running the general manager position. There was seemingly nowhere else to go but up. And yet, the guy comes in and does a worse job. Or an equally bad job as the man before him. And... It gets to the point where sometimes where you could be a football fan and you just become an out and out cynic. I'm sure there weren't high expectations for from Jets fans for this season. Maybe ironically, you say, "Yeah, we're going to the Super Bowl," but honestly, I mean, you just you just want them to just at least get into the playoffs, and that's not happening. Still more the same. Still shuffling these quarterbacks. Michael Vick was supposed to come in. As a mentor. Now I'm sure he signed up to be a mentor. Maybe come in in certain situations. But not like this. And of course. With any fan base. Like I said. Experiencing it here in Chicago. People want answers. People want accountability. They want to point that finger in the right direction. And they want changes. And of course. The first The first change that you look to is the coach. It's usually the coach that gets a lot of the blame. And in a lot of cases, that's not wrong. But I think in this case, oddly enough, and this is me from the outside, and anybody from the nation's largest market, media market, you can can let me know at Sims Coliseum through the chat here on Spreaker.com. Rex Ryan, the head coach, isn't he isn't the problem to me. It's a lot of people around him. It's the people that were put in the positions, the players that were put in the positions that they're in that just aren't they aren't good. And I I guess I guess when you think about it, maybe Rex does have a hand in some of the people. Like during draft day, he's probably making he's probably putting in some input you would think right but i i personally take more issue with the offensive coordinator i mean if we remember marty morningweg he pretty much took away he him he did it took away a win from this team like this team is one and seven but they could they could be two and six i mean that's that's a little iota of 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 optimism you know one more win it's probably three more wins than a lot of jets fans expected if they if they're that cynical about it and uh, you know and just like i said with the gm that's that's the guy who i have the beef with the most with with putting a lot of these players in these positions and not picking up the guys and you really can't 
and and when we see that everybody's under the same salary cap and everybody and there are teams that just make it work it's really disappointing when you see your team in the salary cap era not make it work and and fans across the country when their team is bad they like to blame the fact that there is a salary cap but teams make it work i mean that we've had champions that we haven't had all eight and eight we haven't had all losers there have been teams that have looked great and and there's key reasons usually a lot of them have quarterbacks i'm thinking about it now yeah everybody's had a quarterback but if i've learned anything from those those underdog teams from those teams out of nowhere that win championships is that just because there is a main way, a main roadmap to get to a championship, that isn't the only way. And if you make it work well enough, if you develop your team well enough, then you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. But unfortunately, a lot of these professional leagues are copycat leagues. So a lot of these teams are trying to get the same pieces as these other championship teams and they're they're settling or they're overreaching for players and they end up in positions like these like oh this team has an elite quarterback so we got to draft a quarterback and we're and if he may be raw in talent but we're going to develop him and he's going to be great and you end up with one and seven or you end up with oh and seven like you do in oakland which i will uh, get to over in the next segment or we have to have these many receivers. Like you have to have these key receivers. Sometimes it's better to go against the grain. And whatever is happening in New York, whatever is happening in a lot of these other cities, whatever is happening in Chicago, it's not working. And I don't know the contract situation in New York. And over over time, as I continue to talk about these teams, I'll, I'll, I'll know more about about a lot of these teams across the country. But sometimes these teams are stuck in certain situations with certain players in terms of financially. But you have to figure out a way to make it work. That's why these front office people are in the positions that they are in. This is why they are given the money they are given. I I go from a total train wreck to... A total dumpster fire right after this. It's Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network and Spreaker.com.
Raymond Sim Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. I hope you're ready for some basketball. I'm sure you are. It's opening night, not in the NBA, but in the UBC. It'll be the Chicago Inferno taking on the Newark Wrens tonight at 7 Eastern at youtube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sportsnet. And the United Basketball Clubs will be having games on Wednesdays and Saturdays for the most part for most of the season, give or take some special games. So be sure to check that out over on the YouTube page for the Coliseum Sports Network, which is where this show gets archived over to. Hi, guys. How you doing over there? Uh, be sure to comment on the video if you have any uh, comments on the topics or what I should talk about moving forward. Uh, like the video because I'm sure you'll like it. So, you know, actively, physically like it and then subscribe because, of course, all my shows that I do on Spreaker.com live will be done over there or will be archived over there. So if you miss anything from here, you won't miss a thing because it'll be over there on YouTube. And uh, that's a, v- a great arrangement that I like very much. Last bit of football talk here before we move on to baseball and then more football. And I just got done talking about the 1-7 in seven New York Jets. I want to talk about the 0-7 oh Oakland Raiders now. Wait, wait, don't, don't turn. I promise this will be good. And... This was something this is something that I've that has happened to me ever since I've been doing talk radio going back to my college days, which was last year. But, you know, over the the, over the few years that I've been doing uh, sports talk radio, I've always been drawn not to the biggest story. Usually it's something that I'm already interested in. I'll focus on it. I'll study it. And then I'll just nerd out on air. Now I had to rein it back a little bit when I was doing shows with multiple co-hosts. So we would talk about the more popular stuff. And of course I'd have opinions on that like now. But whenever we did talk about popular stuff like say the NFL or the NBA. I was always more so driven. Or riveted. To the teams at the bottom of the standings. You know. uh, Teams that wouldn't have wins. Teams that were on huge losing streaks. Especially in football. Maybe not in college football so much because there's so many teams. Well sometimes in college football and definitely in college basketball. But uh, in the NFL... Especially at times like this in the beginning of the season and there's still that team. Not the team that's still winning, that's undefeated. But the team that's still losing. And you wonder, are they going to do it? Are they going to go 0-16? And And we just saw that happen not too long ago with the Detroit Lions. They went 0-16. And you can't help but wonder if the 2014 Oakland Raiders are going to do the same. And there's something in particular that intrigues me about this Oakland Raiders team. And it's the quarterback, Derek Carr. And the reason that he does intrigue me is really it boils down to the story that I, you know, that they had run on college game day last year when he was at Fresno State. And it seemed like he had overcome a lot. And I, you know, I I couldn't help but feel a a soft spot for him. You know, a mid-major quarterback making a lot of noise. So... You know, the the nearby football team, of course, there's no hometown team in Fresno where he's from. Uh, The home team is Fresno State, who he played for. So he already played for his hometown team. But the nearby team, the Raiders, they take a chance on him. And I'm excited to see how he develops. And every time that the Raiders lose, which which is every time right now, they're 0-7. I'm always thinking in my head, well... I, I like how he's developing. Like he looks good, right? Uh I don't um mm. I was looking at the stats before the show today. He he's down there. Anytime I, I mean, just in case you get curious and you wanna and and you wanna check out some Derek Carr stats. If you're on your lunch break now, for instance, on the on the East Coast, you know, it's eleven fifty there. If you wanna go ahead and, and check out your uh, your Derek Carr stats. If you're getting a, a itch for that, like you know, yeah, I do want to look up Derek Carr stats. Just go straight down to the twenties. 
in, in quarterback rankings, whatever the ranking may be, doesn't matter. Passing yards, um, yards per game, uh, attempts. He's in the 20s in a lot of them. Actually, uh, he might be a little higher with attempts. But, uh, yeah, pretty much in the 20s. He, he's a lower third quarterback. And I don't know what I expected. You know, I like I understand he's developing and I, I was like, he's not so bad, right? I mean, he's not Andrew Luck. He's not tearing it up or else the team wouldn't be 0-7. But yeah, I was generally, I was genuinely surprised when I saw how low on some of the rankings Derek Carr is. And if they keep losing... Uh, I'm sure I'll come back around to this topic just to kind of give an update because I know you're not watching Raiders football. Hey, you might live in, in the San Francisco Bay Area and hey, you might not be watching Raiders football. But yeah, he, he uh, he's coming along. That's what I hear. And so I looked it up and I hope he is. Uh, apparently he's still a, an improvement over Matt Shaw who is right behind him. And it's really interesting just how the mighty have, have fallen. I mean, Matt Schaub was the man in Houston. And then it, it just went bad. It just went south last year and they ended up only uh, winning a couple of games and he was shipped out of there. And now, and he got the start, if I recall correctly, he actually got the start at the beginning of the year. Or maybe he didn't. I'm going to go ahead and check. But I know Matt Schaub, okay, no, it was Derek Carr from day one. Uh, Matt Schaub was supposed to come in and back up. And now he's playing behind a, a, a rookie that is struggling but developing and yet he's still he's not being considered like no this is Derek Carr's and it's just funny life comes at you fast in the NFL that's that's really the lesson to learn here boys and girls but i must say looking at the at the recap of the Raiders and Browns 23 to 13 was the final score to send the the Raiders to a uh, 0 and 7 record. That did not look like a fun game. It just didn't. Looking at the recap of that game, a lot of field goals, a lot of sea bass time. Janikowski, he was out there. He's getting those kicks in. Uh, I don't know who has them in, in fantasy. You are a lucky person. And, and I am happy for you. And I hope that you are receiving wonderful gifts from the still going leg of Sebastian Janikowski. I guess those, uh, that first round pick, it's paying off. Granted, you probably could have got a better player in the first round. I'm sure Sebastian Janikowski would have been around in the later rounds. But, hey, Al Davis and crew, they took a chance. And technically, it's it's still paying off. So there's that. You still got the old reliable kicker. But for the most part, this team still in shambles. Uh, I looked at the depth chart, saw James Jones on there. And at first, uh, you know, I, I like to play out scenarios in my mind a lot. I daydream a lot. Uh, at first, I was thinking, man, I bet James Jones sure does feel stupid for leaving Green Bay. And then I just thought in my head, me criticizing James Jones and him listening to the show and just being like, what? Uh, I, I can't hear you over all this money. I assume that James Jones is just fine. I mean, granted, his team is a mess. And he has not won since he's been in Green Bay. But he lives in California. And while every part of the country has its own beauty... I think it's generally accepted that, that California can be a really groovy place as long as you're not afraid of earthquakes and traffic. But other than that, 
I, I'll say this. You should probably get used to, to bad team talk. Because like I said, they intrigue me. Because I want to figure out what's going wrong. Like not not disappointing teams like the Bears. And not even teams like the Jets. Like I just want to talk about the Jets because that was really the only one of the game, the teams that was intriguing me this week. For the most part, like really bad teams, like 0 and 7 teams, or when we get to college basketball soon, like 1 in, in 1 and 12 teams that are in that are like getting beat up in in, in money games, and then they got to go play conference schedule. You know, games like that. Those those are things that I, I pick up on. So if you if you're a fan of piling on or. If you want to air your grievances about your team, if you're a long-suffering fan of what of a franchise or of a school, uh, this is the place to do it. Just keep that in mind moving forward. Uh, the chat is open here on Spreaker.com. You can at me on, on Twitter, and I'll, I'll at you back probably during the during the breaks because uh, I gotta I gotta focus on what I'm talking about here during the during the segments. Yeah, let's all let's all talk about bad teams together. It'll be fun. Now this isn't going to be bad team radio, but hey, sometimes you just got to look at look at other teams to realize that your grass is greener in your own lawn. So that's not so bad. It's not so bad. Got another minute here before I go to break again, and there wasn't because of the World Series, which I I didn't I didn't watch. I decided I'd watch Bar Rescue and to catch a contractor. I always like shows like that. Where the establishments are just so obviously bad. And it's like, what are you even doing? Why are you open? And you got to bring in the, the the boisterous, gruff, firm uh, expert to come in. Your John Taffords. Your Gordon Ramsay's. I like shows like that. Your Adam Carolla. In this case, he's a, he's a complete departure from that because he's a funny guy. But I like shows like that. When either, you know. These crappy owners turn things around or they get put in their place. And Bar Rescue delivered on that. And so did To Catch a Contractor, my first time watching it yesterday. And it was pretty good. Adam Carolla, he was, he was really cheesy. College football and baseball on the other side. Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Raymond Sims Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network. Streaming live at Spreaker.com. Archived on the Coliseum Sports Network YouTube page. YouTube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sportsnet. Where we will also have live United Basketball Clubs basketball. Uh, starting tonight, opening night. Chicago against Newark. 6 o'clock. 
at that very website, youtube.com slash user slash Coliseum Sports Net. If you don't know what the United Basketball Clubs is, that's a fictional league, one of three that I am making up and presenting to you with, uh, in depth on the Sims Coliseum website, simscoliseum.com. Uh, I'm going to be getting a season preview, preview out to you uh, by the end of the week. Uh, Thursday is pretty much an established day off for most of the year, most of the season for the UBC. So I should have it out to you by then. By then, I think all of the teams should have played uh, at least one game by then. So you won't have missed much between the, the season preview and when it between now and when the season preview is supposed to come out. Friday at the latest, Halloween at the latest. But uh, we're, I'm getting into the second hour here, second and final hour. Last week when I did this, I was recording, I was broadcasting, everything was good, and it just cut out. And I thought I did it there with something with my the the something with the sound in in my headphones, but I got paranoid there and I'm kind of paranoid now. It's streaming just fine. Hopefully everybody is getting a clear connection. Uh the the thanks to Xfinity or Comcast, the internet's a little iffy here at, at headquarters, but for the most part, it gets the job done, so hopefully it gets the job done here and I can get through the the second hour here with no problems. Got baseball on deck here. <laughs> baseball on deck, baseball term. But I actually, I want to touch on something I just saw before I got back on the air. Uh, apparently, Michael Smith and Jamel Hill, co-hosts of Numbers Never Lie, will not be co-hosting Numbers Never Lie anymore. They will be co-hosting a show called His and Hers, which is based off of the name of the podcast that they already do uh, through ESPN. Apparently, they're, they're going to rename the show. As a matter of fact, I have the press release right here, which came out today. To further capitalize on the theme of a personality-focused ESPN2 lineup, Michael, Hill, Michael Smith and Jamel Hill's Numbers Never Lie will be rebranded his and hers, starting Monday, November 3rd, the 60-minute studio show will continue to air at its normal time on weekdays at noon Eastern on ESPN2. I chuckle at that because it's funny, one, how num numbers never lie even started. It was supposed to be a, a vehicle for Carissa Thompson. She came over from Versus. Or was she freelance? It was like she she did NHL stuff, and she was on versus games. But I don't know if she was under you know working for the NHL or if she was working for NBC. But she came over to ESPN, and she was supposed she did numbers never lie. And then they moved her over to Sports Nation. I'm sitting here trying to remember this woman's career. Then she, they moved her over to Sports Nation where she replaced Michelle Beadle, who went over to NBC. And then she was there for a while. Or maybe the Numbers Never Lie came after the Sports Nation. She came over for Sports Nation, came over to Numbers Never Lie, and then she left to move over to Fox, if I'm remembering that correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's fine. It's fine. I don't mind to be corrected. Like Aaron Andrews said to Hunter Pence a couple of days ago. But then, you know, uh, Michael Smith and Jamel Hill, they moved into that spot. And, you know, they, they would... Or no, Michael Smith, him alone, moved into that spot. And it would be a, a rotating cast of analysts. And then it became Hugh Douglas. Hugh Douglas was there. And it was very interesting, the turning point of that show. Like, granted, the Carissa Thompson departure might be a huge turning point. But I think the bigger turning point was when they started including Jamel Hill because Michael and Jamel, they're bestest of friends and they were doing the His and Hers podcast already. And then she started coming on the show. And apparently, at at the uh, NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists Conference down in Florida, Michael was there, Jamel was there, Hugh Douglas was there, a lot of black journalists were there, as the name implies. And apparently at a party... Hugh Douglas and Michael Smith got into it, and the re and they say the reason that Hugh Douglas got into it with Michael Smith was because he was worried about being replaced by Jamel Hill on that show. Well, that little incident eventually led to Hugh Douglas being dismissed 
uh, from the show and then I think from ESPN. And guess who took his place? Jamel Hill. And I always chuckled at that. That that self-fulfilling prophecy. Sometimes you just got to worry about yourself, people. Because some of those things that you worry about and that you whip yourself up into a lather over, if, you, if you're not careful, that stuff comes true. You worried about that person taking your spot and you so focused on that person taking your spot at your job, for instance. Uh, if you worry about it too much, that's what's going to happen. So be careful. Don't don't be a Hugh Douglas because eventually your spot will eventually be taken by the person that you were worried about and it will come full circle. So this is a natural progression from uh, Jamel coming onto the show and no Hugh Douglas. And, you know, so this is it's interesting that this happened and that now the show will be called his and hers. It'll be focused on Michael Smith and Jamel Hill. The exact thing that Hugh Douglas was worried about. I hope he's doing OK. You know, we all have bad incidents. Happens to all of us, but his a bit more costly. Hopefully he still saved up his NFL money. So with all that being said, there was baseball. Baseball was played. And it was a, it was a huge shift. In the. In the fortunes. Of the Kansas City Royals against the San Francisco Giants. Giants reeled off two huge wins over the weekend. On Saturday, they won 11 to four. Yeah, I think they had a seven-run inning there in in the middle half, in the middle part, middle third of the game. And then yesterday, they shut out the Kansas City Royals five to nothing. And it was behind the great pitching of Madison Bumgarner, who has been a beast this entire postseason. This kind, this was just a game to kind of emphasize that once again, like the Giants could sharpie in wins when Bumgarner's up at the mound. Bumgarner just led the Giants to a game one win, seven to one, behind his pitching performance. So he comes back around here for game five and takes care of business and shuts the door yet again. And that's on the back end of a two-game winning streak. So the Giants are now ahead on this travel day, three games to two. So they go back to Kansas City, the last ballpark open in all of Major League Baseball for the season. Uh, Pretty much the uh, the last baseball park open in all of organized baseball is Kauffman Stadium, where these final two games will take place. And they have a chance to win in six. It'll be interesting to see how much of a home field advantage comes into play. There wasn't much when Bumgarner was on the mound in game one. But still, you know these Royal fans are going to come out and show up. Because they have a reason to show up for the first time since pretty much 85. And you wonder if that NL style of baseball is going to hold up against a Giants team that has momentum. Now, I think momentum can be overrated at times, but I believe in it. I like I think it's a real thing. But it's just a matter of uh of how much you put it into the course of a series, the course of a season. But for the most part, I think there is momentum here in favor of the Giants. Especially when you have what happened last night where you get to the formerly untouchable bullpen law firm of Herrera, Davis, and Holland, and you get three runs off of two of those pitchers, two of those earned, you start to realize that, hey, maybe this 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 string of relievers isn't so tough after all. We can get through them. And so that's what I see happening. Like, as much as people were talking about Herrera, Davis, and Holland, and I guess it's not too out of the realm of possibility to think that relievers can stay hot for a month at a time and and hold it down for their team. But every time that people were were bigging up Herrera, Davis, and Holland, I was sitting there worried, like, you put put too much on, on these guys. Ned Yost trots them out every single time. You expect a reliever to come through every time, but they're not going to because they're human. And here it was last night. 
Now, the question is, have the Giants completely figured them out? Or did uh, Davis and Holland just have a misstep? Or was it Herrera and Davis? That is actually something that I can, in fact, check. Yeah, Herrera and Davis. Is it a, Was it a misstep? Or have the Giants figured them out? Figured out what they bring? Realize that they, they pound the strike zone more often than not. So that you're looking for pitches in the zone. Or is it a slight misstep? Maybe you do know that, but the whole point of how good they are is that you can't hit them most of the time. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. I personally think, like, I think I, I am of the belief that this goes seven, but that the Giants will come out. Because I think that their bats are more consistent. Uh, the Royals can scrape together as many runs as they can. And I think part of the reason that they do so well is because they play, they're an AL team that has to play like an NL team because they lack power. A, a vintage NL team, but still an NL team nonetheless. But I think that once you get, once the good pitchers come out for the Giants, that's when it, that's when it shuts down. That's when it's game over. Coming into this series, I want because I want the Royals to win because of the story, because they're underdog uh, capabilities. But coming into this series, I knew Madison Bumgarner. He was the one. Everybody else, all the other pitchers on the pitching staff were unreliable. You know, they'll they'll do what they can. They can pitch pretty well. That's why they're starters. That's that you know. That's why they get called up to to start games. But for the most part, the the Royals had a chance against those pitchers, just not Madison Bumgarner. And then along along comes Juice Merrill Petit. And in the course of this series, we're probably not going to see him again unless he starts early or perhaps starts game seven. Because I, I don't think he's supposed to start game six. And, and you realize that, oh, the, a lot, these other starters, they can come through at the right time. So we'll see what happens. But I think the Giants might have just a few more tools equipped to take this series and take another World Series championship. We'll get into a little more baseball on the other side here because Joe Madden is on the move, a free agent on the move. Will he land right here in Coliseum land? We'll find out. It's Raymond Sims show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Raymond Sim Show here on the Coliseum Sports Network. 
Hope it's a good Monday for you out here. Looking out the the window here at the uh at the Coliseum Studios here in in Chicago. Not not bad. Cloudy like you expect on a fall day. But you know, it's all right. To, it's a good day to talk sports, isn't it? A little more baseball here before I move into the home stretch. Joe Madden, free agent on the move, and the World Series hasn't even ended yet. Joe Madden just up and leaves the Tampa Bay Rays, a team that he has managed from expansion cellar dweller to World Series finalist, to and they were actual contenders consistently, like you would expect Tampa Bay in the conversation, all in the midst of a, of a low payroll, of low attendance, a below average stadium. He got it done, did Joe Madden. And apparently he he he's done all he could do in Tampa. So he's moving on. Word around town is that he's going he's thinking of going to the Cubs, where they have a manager hired already. But with somebody like Joe Madden's on the move, I mean you, you gotta you gotta listen. You gotta you gotta take a look at it. You gotta consider your options. And in a lot of cases, I, I would have a problem with somebody taking another person's job that they were contracted to uh, perform. I think Rick Rectory has done done a decent job in his first year as Cubs manager. He's got he got the young players up here playing hard, and they really they. They played spoiler there in the final month of the season. And it it, could, it brings a lot of optimism to Cubs fans. But a big name like Joe Madden comes along. And why not make a big splash? It, it worked when Dusty Baker came along. Yeah, he made he made this team a, a one of the, a top performer. I mean, they made it to the NLCS. Uh, what happened there didn't go so well, but for the most part, he had the Cubs as a contending team, and there's a lot of people in this town that look upon those days up fairly fondly up until that NLCS in 2003. So when there's a big splash and you got a guy that's interested in you, interested in your franchise, uh, I say, why not? Why not take the opportunity? And you can hope that somebody like Rick Ritteria will understand, or if he doesn't understand, that maybe he can take, you know, his cachet and not, you know, be bitter about it. Understand it's a business, but just understand, like, yeah, I'm worth more than this. I can, I can go somewhere else and I can perform well with young players, because that was the reason he was brought in in the first place. But somebody like, but somebody like Joe Madden. He can probably take you to the next level. And especially when you're a team with money. And the Cubs have money. I mean, there's no denying it. They have the one of the they have the most most loyal fan base in baseball. They have a major market. They have no salary cap in baseball. So there should be no reason why the Cubs don't spend. I mean, they haven't over the years, or if they've spent, they spent wrong at times, but now they have new owners who are looking to make changes both to the stadium and to the roster. Won't be too far out of the realm of possibility to expect some, some maybe a, a big signing or two over the off season. I, I can't possibly tell you who's available at this point. You, you If you know a guy who's available in the off season, what free agents are going to be on the table. Uh, you know, one more person than I do, but I, I'll figure it out here. Once the hot stove really gets going uh, either on tomorrow or on Wednesday. But th- this is definitely something that I, I think the Cubs should take a chance on, especially because, you know, when, when Joe Madden left on that day that he left and with me listening to sports talk radio, you know, running errands, uh, get you know working on my stuff. You you can't help but think that 
whenever a big name, whether it's a player or a coach or a manager in this case for baseball, becomes available, that your market tries to center it on you. Like, oh, I'm hearing they're going to the Cubs or he's going to the Cubs. Like that happened with Joe Girardi here. Or if you're if you live in Boston, oh, I hear he's coming to the Red Sox. Like I'm sure all 30 franchises were at least thinking that Joe Madden was coming their way, especially the Dodgers. Dodgers fans, I'm sure they were blowing up you know, ESPN LA, ESPN 710, uh, KFWB, uh, the new station they got going there. I'm sure they were calling in like, wait, uh, they, uh, Andrew Friedman said he wasn't bringing Joe Madden. He said Don Manning was the manager. But what's going on here? What's happening? And people are putting two and two together. But the Dodgers are adamant. Like the reports I've been hearing from knowledgeable people are that what he one he's not going to the Dodgers. Andrew Friedman is a man of his word, and two that he's coming to the Cubs. So I'm genuinely surprised. But when you have talk like that, when you have smart people saying that they are hearing from their sources, their reliable sources, that they are considering. Coming to your team, I mean, you, you, you got to believe it at that point to at least think there's a chance. But we'll see what move the Cubs make. I think they should make it. Like I said, it's going to suck for Rick Renteria, but that's life. You, you got to pick up and you got to keep going. Sometimes it's not fair. And something I got to keep in mind is I move forward to what I'm trying to do. Uh, the one example I think of in baseball where somebody just out and out took somebody's job was when the Padres hired Dick Enberg to do Padres games after Mark Neely was doing them for, for about a year or two. Just just boom, up and up. They they hired Dick Enberg, and that pushed out Mark Neely. And Mark Neely's doing fine for himself. He moved up to the network level. He's working for ESPN, doing a lot of those uh, college football, college basketball games out west. Like, it's going to suck for Rick Renteria. But if he can find, you know, an alternative, then he should be good to go. But then you got to think about what does that mean for the Rays, for the Tampa Bay Rays? You lose your GM and you lose your manager. Two guys. That really, honestly, made the made the Rays what they are. An actual contender. We remember those Devil Ray days. When this team was wearing green. And the team was just... They were just an expansion team. They were an easy team to beat up on the in the AL East. Those were guaranteed wins for the most part. Even if... I mean, you know how long baseball is. Teams are going to eke out wins... But you felt embarrassed when you lost to the t- Devil Rays. And then they, they made a change. They, they changed the identity. They brought in Joe Madden. They had Andrew Friedman. And they, they put the pieces together that they had to. They became a championship contender. They fought their way to the World Series. They got hot. Fall, fell to the Phillies, but they put it out there. And ever since then... You, you keep the Rays in, in the playoff conversation, and they, they got in there a couple of times, but you kept them in the conversation throughout the season. You didn't throw throw out the, you know, throw out their chances. You didn't mathematically eliminate them in spring training. Every year they they've been a contender, and now they're missing they're missing something huge now, and you wonder what that means for them going forward. Are they going to be able to pick up a new manager who's uh? Who's going to be just as good? Who's going to be able to rally up the troops? Are you going to get a GM that's just as, as shrewd and, and wise? Are you going to get a stadium in a more convenient part of town for your customers? I mean, I tell you, St. Petersburg, they are they are really holding the, the Rays hostage there in terms of the lease. And I know why. Because St. Petersburg is afraid of what they're going to become when, not if, when the Rays leave. It, 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 now that I think about it, it goes back to that Hugh Douglas situation. 
You worry so much about what's going to happen, and it's going to end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. St. Petersburg's so worried about losing the Rays that they're holding them to this draconian lease. Not giving them any wiggle room for renovation or for movement. I don't even think there's much room for a buyout, but or there's a little. There's always room for buyouts, but a team that doesn't have a high payroll eating all that money just to move out, that's gonna be rough. Like St. Petersburg is trying to lock this team down, and that's only gonna put them in a position to move away. One of the message boards I looked at apparently linked to something from Hardball Talk. I haven't been on that site in a, in a while, so I, but I think it came from there. That there's rumors that the Rays are thinking of moving to Montreal. Now at this point, as with any uh, any owner threatening to move, it's posturing. No, nothing's official until there's shovels in the ground. And even then, it can get a little iffy there. But at the same time, you, you got to listen. You got to think about it. Like can can Stu Steinberg pull that off? Can he can he get his team to stay in Tampa, in the market at least? Can he do a deal with another city and see if he can get you know some prime land in a good part of town? The ones I've been hearing is either either downtown in Channel Side, I believe that's the neighborhood, or over up by the State Fairgrounds. Which, if I'm not mistaken, is that is that where Raymond James is? Can he pull that off with a team that has a low payroll that doesn't bring out a lot of fans, mostly because of where the stadium is, so I hear, but does well on television? Can he round up enough support? Like, people are watching. They just can't get to the games. Can he round up enough support to get them in a good part of town? Or will Mon- Montreal, will they cough up the money? Because I don't think Steinberg has the money for this. I think he's posturing. But hey... I like Montreal. I hope they get the Expos back soon. And we'll find out if the Rays are going to be that team to ship up north. College football on the other side, including a team on the outside, looking in and probably not getting into the party. Raymond Sim Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. on the East Coast, 11.30 here at the College Team Headquarters in Chicago. 10.30 at altitude. 
in Denver and 9.30 out on the West Coast where you're probably still in traffic and probably late for work. Sorry. Raymond Sims show here on the Coliseum Sports Network heading into the home stretch here. Final 30 minutes of this two hour show. If you would like to advertise with this show, this national show, this sports talk show that pulls in a lot of audiences with the with all of the topics, the wide ranging topics that we discuss on this show, national reach on a reputable site like Spreaker.com, also getting archive reach over on YouTube. So that's another audience, uh, not even just national reach, international reach. Uh, if if Spreaker is available overseas, and it definitely YouTube is, you know, it's a lot of a lot of ears that tune into this show. If you would like to advertise with us, send your business inquiries to Coliseum Sportsnet at gmail dot com. But in the meantime, college football that's happening. That is a thing. I gotta admit, lately to me. It's just seemed like kids from different schools running into each other. I don't know. Uh, college football has been a blur for me for the past couple of seasons. There, there were seasons where I'd really be in depth with what's happening in college football. But outside of what was happening last year with Western Illinois, my alma mater, because I was, I was going there and I was doing games for them. Uh, I, I, I wasn't, I have wasn't really keeping up with college football, or I was last year, but it didn't seem all that interesting until the title game. This year, it seems interesting, but I'm just I can't. It, it's not keeping in my mind to kind of keep up with what's going on there. But I'm getting better here. I still got a little time before the conference championships and bowl games go around. I'm thinking of doing a segment uh, over the course of bowl season where I watch every bowl game. So that that's something that I'm thinking of doing. But uh, it's hard to binge watch sports because they're two, three hours long. We'll see what happens. And if I do, I will definitely inform you of such when the time comes. But right now, let's talk top 25. Let's not make this difficult. Let's just dive into those top teams. Top five of the top 25, Mississippi State, who was able to beat Kentucky. Florida State, don't even know who they played, to be honest. Alabama, Auburn, and Oregon at number five. Pretty much laid it down against California, but then Cal tried to come back, but they were down by too much, so they... So Oregon won 59-41 to in Santa Clara. They did not play in Berkeley, played in Santa Clara. I actually watched a decent amount of that game on Friday. You know, I'm always a sucker for uh, Pac-12 sports. But there's a couple of things that I want to talk about, not necessarily so much in terms of the top five. I mean, it's still SEC dominant. But one of the first things I want to discuss is one of the teams that isn't in the top five that was there last week. And that's Ole Miss. Ole Miss falling to LSU in the final seconds. 10 to 7. A rare defensive battle in football, which I'll get to uh, shortly. But a rare defensive battle there. That really came down to one of the final plays. Bo Wallace for Mississippi, 14-33, 176 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Now that one interception was very key because it came at the end of the game. And here's how it went down. Final minutes of the game, final seconds of the game. Mississippi about to kick a field goal, tie this thing up, going overtime, no frills. And they get a penalty. And they're pushed back five yards. So it becomes a considerable distance for their field goal kicker. So instead, they decide to go ahead and 
run a uh, run a play. So head coach for Ole Miss, Hugh Freeze, he's thinking, okay, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll play it safe. We'll, we'll throw out a bound. We'll throw over the flat, or we'll throw out of bounds so we can stop the clock. Or, you know, we'll throw over the flat. We can no huddle, and we can spike the ball and get in better position. But Bo Wallace, he decides, nah, nah, I'm going rogue. He decides to go for it all, to go for the game-winning touchdown. And so, he drops back. He sees the receiver. He chucks it downfield. And it falls directly into the hands of an LSU defender. And that's the game. And Mississippi comes out with the loss, first loss of the season. Keeps Mississippi from having the their first uh, perfect season in, in a while, in a long time. I don't remember the exact number of years. And it's all because Bo Wallace thought he could play hero ball. And reading Hugh Freeze's quote about that play where he just flat out said, no, that was not me. <laughs> I wanted a safer play. And Bo decided to go a different direction. That that was funny to me. At f- part of me, when I was first reading it, I was like, man, he's throwing him under the bus. But it is what it is. And you got to appreciate Bo's confidence in himself, in his team. Maybe more so in itself. I think he was probably thinking more about himself in that play. But to be able to throw it down the field, to think that his team would have a shot, to throw it down the field and win it all. And the pass landed. Uh, I mean, it landed in the hands of a Tiger defender, but it, it was there. It was by the end zone that if he caught it, he could the receiver could push his way into the end zone for that game-winning touchdown. So it wasn't a completely psycho thing, but it was up there. And it do, it makes you wonder, like, what does that mean for the type of person that Bo Wallace is? How does that translate to the pro level? I have a friend from from a Western days. He graduated a year before I did, and now he's off. I think he's still he's still a grad student. Uh, but he is huge on draft stuff, just draft wizard, and he never saw much in Bo Wallace. I'm looking at his stats now in a vacuum. It, like I'm just I just saw this game and as I and as I have admitted to this national audience I haven't been the most my eye hasn't been the most keen on college football this season but the numbers that he had here against LSU were not good 14 for 33 176 yards he got a touchdown and he got an interception a crucial interception he came out with a QBR of 33.9 and you know how high a QBR goes in college football so that's saying something and I mean you could compare it to Anthony Jennings for LSU 8 of 16 one touchdown two interceptions not a good game either but one the Ole Miss defense has been good all season that's that's why the team was where they are to even be in this position so the defense holding it down. And then at the same time, uh, for all I've been hearing about LSU, I've been hearing much more out of Leonard Fournette than I have out of Anthony Jennings. And correct me if I'm wrong, this seems like more of a running team to me in LSU. Like, seriously, correct me if I'm wrong. And Leonard Fournette, he had his game. He did what he had to do. He averaged almost five yards carry. So even he was good. So all that to say that you could probably you could try to play throw blame off, especially if you're an Ole Miss fan. You probably like saying like, look at the other quarterback; he wasn't good himself. But I think Bo Wallace was in more of a position to show his worth against this LSU team, and he didn't bring it. And so that's what the, what happened here: a guy just going completely rogue. Not a good look for him. Not a good look for his draft stock. 
But maybe this is something that he'll learn from. You know, sometimes you got to have these learning experiences. Remember, he's in college. Maybe he won't do this again. He'll think about this. Maybe he will do it again. And maybe that'll be the moment he'll learn. But I think what he did there in a crucial game against a SEC opponent, that's not a good look. And especially when there's only four slots to get into the college football playoff. When the when the the competition is so tight. When it's 128 teams, technically, that are eligible for the playoff. And there's only four spots to get in. And you're out here making crazy plays like that. that that's, that's a crucial mistake. And it'll be a wonder to see how Mississippi recovers from it. They can still win out. But it's going to be, it's, it's a harder road considering how tough the SEC is in general. And especially the division that they're in, the SEC West, where the, all the other, where the other three teams uh, that were in there last week are in there still. The other thing I want to touch upon in terms of top 25 is number 10 TCU. Did you see that game? Oh my, did you see that game? They were not messing around against Texas Tech. 82 to 27. And it's games like that that make me wonder if there's really any defense in college football. First off, I got to applaud TCU. That was amazing. I was at a I was at a banquet on Saturday in which we we were there until 11. It was crazy. Very long, very long banquet. Not a fan of banquets. And I was looking, it was they had scored 75 by the juncture by the point I was looking down at my sports app to see what was going on. And I saw that they had 75 and I was hoping, come on, give me 80. And they got it. And it was funny because I was looking at the play-by-play as it was happening. And it wasn't like they were actively trying to run up the score. They weren't throwing it completely down the field. They were trying to rush the ball. They were trying to run down the clock and they couldn't help it. They they got in and they scored 82. Try as they, they, try as they could to not. And it really slapped me in the face. It made me realize, oh, there really isn't any defense in college football. Because there's a lot of things that people complain about, about trends over time. Uh, For instance, uh, people talk about how the scoring has gone down in baseball. And I haven't seen it. Like, I've seen the numbers, the averages over the season that have shown that, yes, offense is going down. But then I keep looking in in a micro sense and i'm like well this team just won 11 to 3 this team just they just won 8 to 7 and and yet at least in football i'm finally i see when people complain about the lack of defense oh i see because i didn't just look at that 82 27 game as amazing as that was and complete congrats to trevor boykin for his his record seven touchdowns but I also looked at all the other scores and saw that all of these other scores were like in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Like, what is going on here? Except for one game, Miami and Kent State. It was 10 to 3. Man, I bet compared to all these other games, that was a snoozer. And it's like... How's everybody else scoring 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and sometimes even 80? And y'all are the ones that are behind on the curve. I got a little bit more college football to talk about after this. Raymond Sims Show, Coliseum Sports Radio.
Home stretch here on the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network, streaming live at Spreaker.com. I know I, I said Coliseum Sports Radio. That was out of habit there. Uh, I, have, I have so many names. I'm trying to make sure I get this down right. You know, what what n- to call which network. Just for clarification, in case I mess up some more. This is, you know, this show, the upcoming podcast that I'm going to be doing, the game broadcast that I do on my, anything that's on the YouTube page. All of that is the Coliseum Sports Network. All of that is. Any broadcasting related stuff I do is Coliseum Sports Network. And then there's my website, Sims Coliseum. That is on its own. That is what this show is presented by. So it can be confusing, but it's not. It's really just me making things more difficult. Two more things I want to talk about here before I uh, hit the road. One is another top 25 team that's out here getting work done and not getting any recognition for it. In the last segment, I talked about uh, Mississippi's uh, costly mistake, and I talked about TCU's uh, hammering of an in-state rival. And it really is amazing how much TCU's turned around in terms of their football program. Their basketball program, not so much. We'll see how that goes. But how about Marshall? Number 23, Marshall. 8 and 0. Oh, pretty much tearing through everybody. Their last win was on Saturday. 35-16, hosting Florida Atlantic. And those 35 points, that was an off game for them. Before that, they had scored anything under 40 points before then. And it's it's to be expected, even when you're that good amongst your peers down there in the Conference USA, you're going to get the best from each team, especially this at this juncture in the season. So you're not going to be, unless you're just that amazing. And in, in, in mid-major football, I suppose they are that amazing. You're going to have these off games. I put off in air quotes. But still, Marshall, dominating. Let me run these scores by you because I have that time to do that right now. 42 to 27. 48 7. 44 14. 48 17. 56 14. 49 24. 45 13 against Florida International in Miami. And then the team right up the highway in Boca Raton comes up to West Virginia and they get some of it too. Marshall gets a bye week, by the way, and then they they, uh, they go to Hattiesburg to take on Southern Miss on the 8th. All of this annihilation. And they're number 23 in the nation. Unintentional rhyme. But if you look at the schedule, it's very clear to see why. Because all those scores I named off were against teams like uh, Miami of Ohio. Not Miami of Florida, Miami of Ohio. Huge difference in football talent. Rhode Island, which is an FCS school. Ohio, not Ohio State, Ohio over in Athens. Great journalism program, by the way. At Akron. At Old Dominion, a transitioning school. I think they're still in the midst of their transition. And then they move into their, uh, well, Old Dominion is in conference, but they're still transitioning in football. Middle Tennessee, Florida International, Florida Atlantic. So for all of the beat down, the beat them downs that they have been handing out like candy on Friday. It's been against weak teams, Conference USA teams. So it's very obvious why this team is not getting more recognition. That's. That's not my problem, per se. My issue is that this team is an FBS team. Like Northern Illinois that we just saw during this Jordan Lynch era and a little bit before that when Jerry Kill was the coach, too. These teams are annihilating their competition. They're doing what they have to do. The schedule that they they lay out for themselves 
these players go out, these coaches game plan for it, and they 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 not only get the job done, but at a whole other level than the competition that they're playing. And though it is very clear that Marshall could go up to Morgantown and they might get routed, especially with the offense that Holgerson and their crew run. Uh, granted, Rakeem Cato, the QB at Marshall, will probably they, he could probably get some points off of them too because they're one of those teams that just refuses to play defense. And and when I see things like that, and I was thinking about this last night, a lot last night, it just makes me wonder why are why even bother? Not for Marshall. They should keep winning. They should keep doing what they have to do. They go out there, they play hard, they get their scholarship, they earn their scholarship. But why is it set up like this? That Marshall is probably going to run away with Conference USA, and all they're going to get is some bowl game in the middle of nowhere. And while I'm ranting here, let me see if I can find out that particular bowl game that Conference USA winners get. But it's so clear that there is a a disparity here between the talent levels at the big five level that's going to get into this college football playoff, which is supposed to be for everybody, and Marshall down here in mid-major FBS with the Sun Belt and Conference USA and the Mountain West even. And I do think that it is time at least in football, though I'm sure that people are going to call for it to be across the board, that these big five schools, they need to split away. They got their playoff. They're doing what they have to do. But it's very obvious that a team like Marshall cannot go in and compete for that playoff in terms of talent level, despite how good they are at this level. North Dakota State isn't about to come in and beat up on, well, maybe North Dakota State's not a good example. They they handled Kansas State pretty well, and they are three-time FCS champions. But a, a, a very good team is not going to be able to come in and and take on these big dogs that have made us their own table for which to divide their own pie. So I think that it's not a, it's not a matter of everybody getting a medal. But there's levels to this, as the philosopher Meek Mill has said very recently. There's levels to this, and it needs to be established. There's clear disparity at the FBS level. No two FBS teams are all the same. There's a difference between Ohio State and New Mexico State. And I think that needs to be better established. But that's just a rant of mine. Uh, I have many more of them. I'll have more of them for you tomorrow. And I hope that you will join me then. Uh, tonight, just keep in mind, I have uh, I have um, the, the UBC opening night. So that I'm going to have that, and that should be fun. That's going to be... Um, at 6 o'clock Central, 7 o'clock Eastern, because the home team is is based out of Newark, New Jersey. So check that out. I'm going to be broadcasting that. And it's going to, begin, to be the beginning of a great season. I got winter baseball coming for you, too, over on the Coliseum Sports Network, the Paramount League. And then in the spring, I'm going to have football for you before you even get a, a touch of withdrawal from the NFL season, which will have just ended once my season starts. Uh, I think the Liberty Bowl is where the Conference USA champion goes. I'll I'll double check that for you and I'll bring it to you tomorrow here on the Raymond Sims Show on the Coliseum Sports Network. Y'all be smooth. I did. One.